Hello and welcome to 2020 Politics War Room with James Carvel and I'm Al Hunt. We are proud partners with the Sign Institute of American University and can't wait to get back there when this shelter at home subsides. We have some great guests today, James, but first don't forget to subscribe to 2020 Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. James, uh, how you doing down there? Hanging in there, man. You know, excited about the show. This is one of the best shows we ever had. The guests today are just awesome. It is unbelievable. I'll, 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 I won't tease people anymore. We're going to have Charlie Sykes and Tim Miller of The Bulwark, and then we're going to have the great Ron Cherno, author of, I think, one of the best presidential, maybe the best presidential biography I've ever read on Grant uh, and the inspiration for this history a series channel. So we're going to get to that. But James, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about something that we don't focus on as much. We focus so much on the presidential race. The second biggest contest this year are uh, are in the United States Senate, which now the Republicans control 5347. If Trump's reelected and the Republicans still control the Senate, I mean, just, you know, forget it. Anything he wants, it's a blank check. But but as is likely, Biden wins. Uh, The Democrats have to pick up uh, at least three seats net for a 50-50 for a majority. So let's run through some of these races and, uh, you know, put on your uh, put on your political hat and uh, not that you ever take it off. But first, let's start Arizona and Colorado, two of the strongest Democratic candidates, astronaut Mark Kelly in Arizona, former Governor John Hickenlooper and a graduate, I would say, of the Haverford Prep School. He doesn't like to remind people uh, in Colorado, running against two incumbents, Cory Gardner in Colorado and Martha McSally appointed in Arizona. How do those two races look, James? Right now, it's a clear Democratic favorite. And as Ron Brownstein points out, that would be the first time since the 40s that Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada all had Democratic senators. So I'd say that both both are likely deep. Montana and Kansas. Montana, you have Steve Bullock, uh, the governor, running against an incumbent senator. Kansas uh, is an open seat, uh, and the Democrats haven't elected a senator from Kansas in, I don't know, what, 80-some years, but the Republicans could nominate this right-winger, Chris Kobach. Any 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 chance in the Sunflower State, James? Well, yeah, I mean, as a Democratic governor under the same circumstances, and there was this whole thing about McConnell and him wanting Pompeo to go back, and I don't know how much he's been hurt by his current troubles, but that's a possibility. You still have to say... The Democrats need to catch it. They need to catch a break to have a chance. Yeah, yeah. Montana, no worse than 50-50. No worse. Pretty hard to come up with a stronger candidate in a red state than Steve Bullock. No, really can't. Um, Not in Montana. I mean, the fact that he, he ran is a big statement about Democratic chances in 2020. Okay. Um, let's move on. Uh, we now have the Democrats probably picking up you know, maybe three or close to three, two or three, um, Iowa and Maine. Uh, Iowa, Joni Ernst is the incumbent one last time. There's a primary out there next week. Strongest Democratic candidate, they say, is a woman named Theresa Greenfield. If she wins that primary or gets over, I think, 35 uh, percent, she'll run against Ernst in the fall. And up in Maine, you have the House Speaker uh, of the State House, Sarah Gideon, running against Susan Collins, long-term senator. First of all, by way of disclosure, I'm doing a – fundraiser of Sarah Gideon on Zoom tonight. So uh, she's a favorite right now. I think she's up in the polls by some. Collins has been really hurt by all of this. Her mystique, I think, is wearing thin in Maine. I would call Gideon a slight favorite. For now, I would call Ernst a slight favorite, but really just doing it, just to do it, is probably more of a toss-up in Iowa. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, most most uh, the conventional wisdom is that Trump wins Iowa. He won it by, I think, nine points last time. Uh, and Ann Selzer, the best pollster in America, along with Peter Hart, uh, had um, had 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 Trump up, I think, about nine or ten. I, I don't believe that anymore. I think it's changed. I, I think Biden's got a real shot in Iowa, probably maybe a slight underdog. And if that's the case, I think Greenfield's got it, you know, again, about a 50-50. Yeah. I'd say look better than 50-50 in Maine, 50-50 in Iowa. Yeah. Uh, so right now, I'm just adding this up. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, three 50-50s and three D pickups so far. Uh, 
Uh, I'm I'm counting Kansas as 50-50. It may be less than 50-50, but anyway, Iowa and Montana are. All right, uh, let's uh, move down south. North Carolina and Georgia actually have three races there because there are two in Georgia. North Carolina, Tom Tillis, uh, an incumbent, a one-term incumbent, is running against a veteran and former state legislator, uh, Cal Cunningham. Georgia, uh, there's two races. David Perdue is the incumbent senator running for re-election, and then in a race to, to – Fill the seat of Johnny Isaacson, who resigned. You have a bitter Republican primary between Kelly Leffler, uh, who was appointed by the governor, uh, you know, running uh, against Doug Collins. I, He's a real Trumpster. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'd always heard he was a guy with some independence. And during uh, the impeachment, he showed he was a lapdog. Uh, he's got a real chance to knock off that incumbent senator, though. Oh, well, he will. Senator. Yeah. I mean, she's been really hurt. And I don't think they want her. She was hurt by you know, the fact that she traded stocks, uh, I guess, in February uh, when uh, the charge is or the question is whether she had inside knowledge. Now, how about the two? How about the Democrats? The Democrats well positioned to take on either one of those, though, if it's Collins uh, and Purdue. It looks like it's going to be Ossoff, who, you know, wasn't, they wasn't maybe the greatest congressional candidate, but people claim he's gotten better. Um John Ossoff, who ran in a special in 2017 in law. Right. And then you have the, the mayor of Columbus, who would be, most people think would be really strong. That's in the race against Purdue. Uh, no, against La- the Loffler seat. Oh, okay. So the Purdue seat is Ossoff. He's got it wrapped up, uh, apparently. Is there any other? No, he's running against Loffler. The Purdue seat is, it's two different things. In okay. one, there's a regular Democratic primary in a Republican primary, and then they vote on on the election day. Purdue runs on election day, and then the election is in January. So it's theoretically possible that the Senate, it's not theoretically, it's actually very possible that the Georgia election in January determines who controls the Senate. Man, that's, uh, that's not something to wish for. No. But I, I would say this. I just have to say the Democrats are 50-50 to pick up one. Uh, I don't know why I say that. They're probably, if you, your circumstance is going to change. But they're definitely, you know, if you look at what Stacey Abrams, and she did all of that, and the, the black contribution was not any higher, much higher than it was in the past. I mean, they're losing I mean, they're getting, they're going to get the crap beat out of them in these Atlanta suburbs. Right. Uh, let's move up to North Carolina. That's charitably, I'm going to call that a lean Democrat. I'd be surprised if, if we don't win that race. The Democrats don't. Really surprised. Cunningham's supposed to be a pretty good candidate. And I mean, just the North Carolina Republican Party, it's just the corruption has got to hurt. I mean, every time you turn around, there's corruption going on. And I don't think they're helping themselves with this Charlotte convention stuff. I really don't. Well, tell us why. Well, people are not going to be excited about 50,000 people coming around the country, crowding themselves in, in, in the city of Charlotte, and then in having people from Charlotte having to work the convention to be in there. I mean, golly, I mean, you, you, you think if you're a, a mom, you feel good about that? I mean, I think, I think this is a losing fight for them. How about if they pull the convention because the mayor and the governor set the kind of restrictions that they say is unacceptable and move it either to Atlanta, where I think the mayor will pose the same set of issues for him, or move it to Florida somewhere? I don't, you know, I think it's just all the stunt. I don't think he's going to be able to have a traditional convention. I, I, I really don't. But he's, uh, he's got a... What he does is he just now he's starting to drive this conversation. And we're going to pull out. Well, the truth of the matter is they got contracts. God knows what not. I mean, it's a, it's a nightmare. And then, yeah, you got to deal with the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, one demo, I, there are not there are several Democratic seats. Republicans say they're contesting. The only one that I really take seriously is Alabama. Uh, with Doug Jones, who won on a special. It's a very red state. There's a big primary coming up next week. Uh, you got to you got to rate the Democrats underdogs in Red Alabama, don't you? I, I would, but the one thing about Doug Jones is he's lucky. Does it matter who wins the Republican primary? 
uh, former Auburn coach Tommy Tuberville or former Attorney General Jeff Sessions? The, the theory is it would be better if it was Sessions because Trump wouldn't come in and help. Mm-hmm. That's the theory. I, I, I don't know. And Sessions is fighting back pretty hard now. It, I, I'm just telling you that's the theory. I don't know if the theory is correct or not. Well, basically, as I tabulate now, uh, you have the Democrats with a net pickup of three seats to start with, which would take it to 50-50. And if Biden's elected, that means Democrats would control the Senate. But there are three toss-ups. And if they win one or two of those, then they have, you know, a little bit of a cushion. So right now, the Senate looks pretty good for Democrats. Well, we got a couple more we need to talk about. Well, okay, go ahead. You bring them up. Texas. What? Texas. Yes, Texas. I, I don't see any reason why we would be anything other than a ever so slight underdog. And Alaska. Alaska. Well, last time they were, what? They had... Uh, Ernest Grooning or something. Well, Mike know. Gravel was there for a while. Too, Mike Gravel. Uh, they got an independent. Al Gross is an MD, commercial fisherman. His father was the author of the Permanent Fund. Uh, you know, real, real Alaska roots. Uh, he's, he's an independent, but he kind of sanctioned by the Democrats, like Angus King. And he's an underdog, but not prohibitive at all. Not at all. Yeah, that You look at that board that you've just uh, put on the table, and um, if, if, uh, if Biden wins by four or five, they're likely to be 50-50, 51-49. If Biden can win by eight points or 10, 10 points even, uh, you're going to have 55, 56 Democratic senators. So, you know. I, I'm going to tell you one more. Yeah. The, South Carolina. South Carolina is not Kentucky. It's got a like a plus nine lean. All right. And it's and it's going to go down because there's a lot of migration into South Carolina and a lot of it by college educated people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, Biden would have to do very well. But Harrison is a really good candidate. And Lindsey is, you know, the Trump people are not crazy about him. The, the anti-Trump people hate him. It, I'm, I just keep it in the back of my mind. He had, a, he had one of his major contributors who switched, left him because he said if he can't stand up for his best friend, John McCain, after he was dead, you know, he ain't going to stand up for people in South Carolina if it really matters, which I think was uh, was pretty telling. Yeah, I, I, again... I would have it out of sight, but not out of mind. You know, it'll get close. Before we get to our great guest, um, I want to say the other thing that really is at stake here, which, you know, there's not much point in going over because it's too uh, granular, are state legislatures. I mean, in uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, North Carolina, how the top of the ticket does is going to have a big effect. Right now, Republicans control 60% of the state legislatures. Uh, uh, they won 52% of the votes for state legislature last time. Uh, and that great, I mean, their, their shrewdness in 2010 is what enabled them to have that kind of dominance and also enabled them to probably have eight or 10 House seats uh, that they might not have had. So those legislature races, hard to give attention to them, but they are terribly important too. Who uh, oh, are are they? James, we have two terrific guests who four years ago and probably next year, we'd be debating on taxes, health care, the role of government. But now they're among our very, very favorite journalists. Charlie Sykes, who was an influential conservative Wisconsin talk show host, and Tim Miller, former official at the RNC, communications director for Jeb Bush four years ago. They are the founder and a lead writer for the most interesting political site, The Bulwark. They're all conservative, maybe with a a tad moderate uh, Republicans, uh, but they're anti-never Trump and the stuff is biting and it is really good. Uh, I would recommend it to anyone listening. It's called The Bulwark. Charlie and Tim, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks. So happy to be with you all. Go Tigers. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, (laughs) Charlie, uh, you guys know that Trump stole your party 
and he prostituted conservative values. How in the world did that happen? Boy, I don't know that I have a, a short answer to that. I mean, he, you know, originally I thought he stole the party, but apparently the party sold itself out. Uh, this this capitulation by the Republican Party continues to be just a soul crushing experience, uh, disillusioning uh, and and depressing. Because, you know, I mean, you know, Tim can t- talk about this as well. I mean, what we found out was that we thought we knew what Republicans, who Republicans were, what they actually believed. And it turns out that we were we were wrong. Otherwise, we would not be sitting here where we are. Well, Tim, pick up on that, because uh, I, I'm not surprised uh, about much of anything with the Trump presidency. I am surprised about, as Charlie put it, the total capitulation of re- the Republican Party office holders. He dominates his party more than oh, Ronald yeah. Reagan and way did. more than Bush did. I mean, you know, at this point, um, uh, it's not quite at this point, but you know, in the Bush presidency, his his numbers were so got very low with the Republicans. The same people who are Trump's biggest cheerleaders, the Laura Ingrams of the world, you know, were were attacking him on things like Harriet Myers and Katrina um, and other matters. And so, um, you know, I, a big part of this is that Trump. Uh, has a cultural hold over the party, and 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 what has happened is unlike in past Republican administrations where the critics came from the right and from the sort of populist uh, element of the party. Um, this time, most of the critics that have stayed with him have come from the center. His critics from the right, such as Mark Levin, um, all of these folks have have capitulated because that's what their audience wants. That's what the fans want, and so Trump has this hold over the party because there's been this kind of realignment that is happening that is causing, you know, all us and James to be here together right now, where a lot of the kind of suburban Republican voters um, who would have in another era, you know, been kind of the Republicans that are pushing back against Trump, a lot of them have left the party. And a lot of them are the reason why Joe Biden is a Democratic nominee right now. Um, and, and meanwhile, there's been a, a new influx of people that were maybe Perot Buchanan voters into the party who are who are diehard Trump. So, uh, so this is really a bottom-up thing. Um, the, to- the the Republican, the new Republican base wants Trumpism, and, and the Republican leaders are too cowardly to do anything about it. I mean, after all, you remember Marco Rubio ran for the Senate in 2016 on the basis of being able to be a check on either president. <laughs> How's that turned out? Haven't been a whole lot of checks. Let me ask you one more, and then and then turn it over to James. Uh, the Trump supporters or the apologists say that the Republican Party conservative movement. Uh, had to adapt. It was too elitist, all about tax cuts for the rich. And the Trumpism uh, has given it uh, more vibrancy, appealed to working class voters. Uh, and that, yeah, he engages in excess and he says things we wish he wouldn't say, but he really is leading the Republican Party where it has to go. Answer, answer that critique. Well, I think there's some there's some truth to that, that the Republican Party needed to adapt, that it was too elitist. It was too uh, wedded to corporate uh, interests. But instead, what have we done? We basically decided to deal with this boil on our face by taking a a chainsaw, uh, chainsaw to it. So uh, the Republican Party hasn't become more populous. It's become dumber and meaner and more wedded to this cult of personality. Uh, And this is this is part of the problem that you have a you have a party in which and, and you know, part of the dynamic is very interesting that that as long as you support Donald Trump you're free to abandon any conservative principle to take any position whatsoever but if you are a critic of Trump then you've betrayed conservatism but within the cult it is not about ideas and i think this is one thing that was exposed i mean Do- Donald Trump really did expose the pre-existing dysfunction of of the party that it was never as fiscally conservative as it pretended to be. It was never as pro-life as it pretended to be. It was never as small government as it pretended to be. And what he's done is sort of to um, expose, but also to accelerate just the pure, raw tribalism of of the of the politics. But and of course, the irony being that that um, his his one big accomplishment, I think, from the point of view of of a lot of Republicans, certainly the donor class is to push through a tax cut, even though it's given us, you know, massive uh, trillion dollar a year deficits. Um, he, he did he did deliver the, the one thing that quote, the quote unquote elites would have wanted him to deliver. 
<laughs> and and just let me add one thing on that really quick. Um, there was a whole group, Al, that that you know, it's it's sort of quaint to talk about them now. Uh, many listeners don't even remember them. Called the Reformocons, and these were um, you know basically a policy oriented group in D.C. That, that tried to do exactly what you said, which is basically reform conservatism away from the kind of corporate you know focus on 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 you know the corporate CEO class towards you know middle and working class Republicans, and, and they put together you know these massive books full of really kind of populist family oriented policy reforms uh, to reorient the party to a more working class base. All that stuff made sense. Donald Trump didn't do any of that. He didn't run on any re- reformist pe- pro family populist uh, policies. You know, all he did was say, we're going to build the wall, make Mexico pay for it and put Hillary in jail. Uh, you know, this is there, there was no substantive pivot away from the elites. Um, it, it was all performative. All right, I want to t- I want to turn to the man who told me M- any day that I don't read the bulwark is a lost day for me, uh, and that's down in Mississippi. James Carville, take over. Thank you. First of all, from each of you, like when did you decide to cross the Rubicon? But what was the moment you said, "Oh shit, I just I I can't take it." I mean, your individual journey from being, you know, lifelong Republicans to I'm going to be for Joe Biden. Well, I mean, the, the first time I, I crossed the Rubicon, of, I mean, in, ter- in terms of Trump, I mean, I, I was Andy Trump from before he came down the golden escalator. So there was there was, there was never there was never any transformation. I think when I saw the Republican Party as a whole decide that it was OK with Donald Trump, that's when it was like, OK, screw this. If this is what it means to be a Republican, then I'm out. There's there's no question about it. So, you know, the the, the being against Trump, who's never been never involved any soul searching. And very early on in like 2015, I said, you know, if if this is what the conservative movement is about, then I guess I'm not part of the conservative movement anymore. So that was that was my my Rubicon. And so I feel that I haven't moved that much. And I've just watched the Republican Party lose its freaking mind. Yeah, like Charlie, I, me and Trump got in a little mini feud in 2012 uh, when he I was working for John Huntsman at the time, and he was uh, thinking about getting into the primary. And, um, you know, we had a little war of words on CNN. Um, but uh, so I've been with, um, I guess it was on ABC. Um, uh, but so I've been against Trump forever. I mean, he's just such a clown and a buffoon and an obvious racist. Like, how, how could you be for him? For me, like Charlie, you know, I, I felt like there was – some some hope, you know, that the that the party would still, you know, resolve itself. I mean, you remember the Mike Lee moment, you know, um, on the floor of the convention. Uh, you know, even Ted Cruz at the time said, "Vote your conscience." I remember talking with Ted Cruz advisors in the days after he said that after the convention, and and there was still a feeling among, you know, his, you know, a split among his his advisors about whether or not he should be for Trump or not. Um, and so it wasn't until all of those guys fell in line in the final weeks of the election and we could not get any of them to 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 come out and and affirmatively you know s- s- uh, argue against Donald Trump to be the next president that I like Charlie just became disillusioned with the with the party broadly and you know I I think I look back on on the Muslim ban as as a as a moment um, within the administration, where where I, I gave I I was not supportive of people going in to work for Trump, but at least I got it. I, I understood the concept of having good people in there for that first month or however long it was until the Muslim ban happened. But when when he implemented that Muslim ban. Anybody who did not walk out of there that day and say, this is unacceptable, you know, we, he, we must be rid of him and the party must be rid of him. Uh, to me, you know, those people were all lost from that point on. So, so Charlie, I mean, you, I knew who you were forever, a really, really big deal in conservative politics and particularly in Wisconsin, which is a very, I mean, the Democrats and Republicans, they're just, it's a shame. They just hate each other. How much flack have you gotten from former friends and, and people that you were politically aligned with when you did this? Has, has there been a lot of backlash against you personally? But let me just run the tape back a little bit. I mean, there was a time through most of 2016, even into 2017, where every single Republican that I talked to in Wisconsin you know, understood who Donald Trump was. Remember, I mean, he lost the primary here. So when you go back, remember what Paul Ryan used to say about Donald Trump, Scott Walker, um, Reince Priebus, all of these folks, they were under no illusions who Donald Trump was. So for most of the year, 
I didn't get much pushback from the elected officials. But what started to happen was the base decided, that, OK, it's a it's a binary choice. It's tribal. We're going to go with Trump um, and became you know more and more intolerant of criticism. And one by one, the people who, again, there was not really a dime's worth of difference about my opinion with Donald Trump from any of the people I just mentioned to you. One by one, they sort of decided to go along. They decided to be transactional. Then they decided to be quiet, and then they decided to become enablers, and now some of them are active cheerleaders. And that that is just appalling. So in terms of people like Paul Ryan, what I like to say is that, you know, I hope that Paul and I are still friends, but it's sort of like we're we're taking a break from one another and seeing other people just for a while. And, and, And one of those guys we overlap with, I just want to say like on Reince, for example, so I was working at the RNC when Reince was there. I had a conversation with Reince in 2016 where I said to him that, that he should resign the, the chairmanship if Trump wins. And, and Reince's argument was he needs to be there to be a check, to be the, you know, um, bumpers, um, you know, outside of Trump. And if Trump went and did something really bad, you know, then he'd quit. And that would be his power and his leverage over him, is what Ryan said to me. You know, six months later, he's the freaking guy's chief of staff. You know? So you can see this, to Charlie's point, all of these, all of these people agreed with us um, in, in private conversations, um, you know, and, and um, so, you know, one by one, it was like the invasion of the body snatchers. It was very much so. Yeah. Now, that, that's Jonah Goldberg's phrase, but it, it, it is so real that you know, one by one watching them, and it was like you could see something happening in their eyes where they would they would go from they would go from finding some way to rationalize it to, you know, th- this guy's not so bad. Or the 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 entry level drug, have to understand on the right is 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 not pro-Trump, it's anti-anti-Trump, which is that you don't actually defend Donald Trump, you just attack other people who criticize him. And there's an entire industry based on anti-anti-Trump, but it is the entry level drug because Sooner or later, most of those fo- those folks do drink the Kool Aid. They do enter the cult, and you know, they, and they and they put on the MAGA hat, and you know, here we are. Yeah, I have students that would say, "I, I look, I'm not going to defend Trump, Professor Carvey. I'll be the jerk and know what he's doing, but I just can't go with AOC. Right? I can't. I can't go with Pelosi. Yeah. Well, then, come on, man. But I mean, that is. I I actually see evidence of that a lot. Anti anti Trump. I don't like Trump, but boy, do I hate the people that hate him. And that, that's where tribalism kicks in at some point. And it's, and it's the only business model for the, the conservative right right now. I mean, if you're if you're on talk radio or you're on Fox News or you have a publication that relies on on the conservative base, you have to be anti anti Trump, really. And that's that is the sweet spot. That's the safe space for them. And this is the, the absurd part of those things, is Charlie. You know, is like they, they they zero in. I mean, in, in some ways, Charlie, you're, or I'm sorry, James, your students are are making at least a, a more advanced argument than some of these pundits, because at least they're saying I can't go for AOC. A lot of these pundits will narrow in on on like a tweet from a Vox reporter. You know, and they'll say that, oh, hey, this random liberal media guy, you know, was unfair to Donald Trump one time on Twitter. And I'm more mad about that than I am about the president of the United States' behavior. And, and that's where these people land. It's a total focus on the media critics are the real enemy and, and ignoring what the president of the United States says and does on a day to day basis. Uh, you know, the, the same people that said that Ronald Reagan brought down the Soviet Union without firing a shot now are of the opinion that the president's words actually mean nothing and are totally meaningless. And as Britt Hume said, it'd be better if he just golfed all day and was the president in name only rather than actually saying anything. Yeah. Uh, You know, do you think any office holders will finally this fall uh, say, okay, four more years would be a nightmare. We can't do that. Are they so afraid? Do they so look with Jeff Flake, Mark Sanford, conservatives who stood up to him and got swamped uh jeff it may well happen to jeff sessions next week is there going to be any profile and courage among prominent republican office holders any guys are going to follow what you guys have done no no i agree i agree and, 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 and in part um it's because this doesn't end after the election even if donald trump goes down you might be thinking okay it's a sinking ship you you know the rats jump off the sinking ship or even if you know you're going down you want to have a certain amount of of pride well we've seen the the, uh, the 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 lack of that, 
I think that people think that the Trump era is going to continue. You will still be hunted down as a heretic or a traitor if, in fact, you do that. And that if you want to have any viability in the Republican Party or the conservative movement going forward, you have to be willing to go down with this ship. So I agree with Tim. And these guys aren't just pregnant. I mean, you know, with Trump, I mean, they've had his baby, you know, the kids being potty trained, learning how to ride a bike. Uh, You know, there's nothing you can do now. They're stuck with him. You guys had a really interesting piece yesterday by uh, Josh Tate that talked about the the, the post-Trump party and what it would be. And it was really a little depressing because he worried that there will be, or I think that's a correct verb, worried. Uh, he certainly pointed out that there may well be an effort, you know, God, we, we, we can't take them on. Let's have a rapprochement. Let's all be in this together and, and, and forget the dark side uh, that Trump has brought to the Republican Party. Yeah, I think that's sadly right. I mean, I'd love to hear James's counterpoint, but I, I'm of the view. Jonathan Last, our colleague, wrote a while back um, an article called "Trump is Forever," and that, and that, yeah, that's where I'm at on this. I, I just he's not going to go to Midland and and you know ride his bike and paint. Like that's not Donald Trump's future as in the post presidency. He's going to have have a very public presence, and and so I, I just it's hard to see how you just you know kind of wash it away. I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn this over to James, but he doesn't have the grace of Richard Nixon. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. Think and think about that for a second. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No, not, not, not even close. Well, and the other thing is, look, I mean, the, the way it's going to play out, if, if, if Donald Trump goes down, if James is right, and this is a repudiation of, of Trumpism, what will heal the Republican Party, and I have quotes around that, will be their uh, joint uh, opposition to whatever the Democrats do, that the Democrats will overreach. And, you know, because this is what conservatives do the best, they are, when, as reactionaries, they will push against whatever they do. But, if you supported Joe Biden or you were not sufficiently supportive of Donald Trump, you will not be allowed back um, to, into the room, the table. I think that there will be that because keep in mind that the Republican Party is still stoked by this outrage machine. And you have to be angry and outraged about somebody. And the most effective form of outrage is to continue the purges, to look for the Republicans in name only or the people who were disloyal. So I think that there will be this reactionary unification, but it will exclude anyone who breaks too overtly from Trump. I have a little bit of a different view. I, I think Biden, and this could very well happen, he, he's going to win. But let's say he gets 290 electoral votes. Senate stays the same. Maybe Democrats pick up one seat and lose two House seats. Trumpism is going to be very, very much alive. It, it, it'll dominate that party. Now, another possibility, because if you look at look at Trump, he's got kind of 43 written all over him right now, maybe less, because you can vary the turnout model and you can move people. If he ends up losing this thing by 10, they won't want to fool with him anymore. And you got to understand part of his appeal is he's a winner. And if you beat him bad, you beat him bad and they see that they're going to be less attracted to it. And it's not a given, you know, if we get the kind of effort that we're getting from from people like you and we can get these Bernie bros to quit fooling around and get in line and do the single most important thing we got to do is not just to beat Trump. You got to beat Trumpism. You got to make it where no one wants to pick this shit up again. And the only way you do that is by a big defeat. It's going to be hard. It's going to take a lot. But you got to destroy the village to save the village. It just you really do. I, I don't know that I fully share James's optimism on what would happen following a, a, a large defeat. But I completely agree that a, a, a big blowout defeat is a worthwhile cause. It's a worthwhile goal. I think it will help us carry an argument. I think that there's a difference between um, a scenario where, you know, Trump loses and can blame the pandemic and and he still sort of owns the party and one where at least people like, you know, Charlie and I and our sort of wing of the party have a fighting chance. And, and I think a blowout, you know, helps us have a fighting chance. Um, and, and I think that a blowout really helps 
you know, kind of Biden and helps potentially, you know, uh, the Democrats create a, uh, a governing majority, um, which, you know, there's some value in that too, um, uh, uh, setting aside the long-term political side. And this guy has this effect. When people run for the Senate or the House or governor, they know if they identify with Trump or if they Trump is, it's going to hurt them in the general. So, I mean, just the, the political backlash or have a, but or, or, or be helpful. Make people think but, twice, at least. Yeah. Yeah. You look, when you beat bad, you look terrible. Terrible. It, it, it would be helpful to toxify Trumpism. However, and I, I'm, I'm always the, the pessimistic voice in the room here. Think about how conservatives regard 1964. Blow out of conservative, blow out of, of Barry Goldwater. You know what they think of that? They think of that, that as the dry run that 16, late, 16 years later got them Ronald Reagan. So just keep that in mind as a mom. Yes, it, you know, but Goldwater, I mean, I remember that well. He actually had a philosophy. Reagan, I mean, you could see the kind of Western conservatism you know, coming into fruition, and it had a, it, it had a philosophical structure to it. This has, this is just a personality cult. This cult, though, James, you don't. I mean, you maybe are exposed to some of them in your class, but man, I'm worried about these red-hatted MAGA kids. You know, I, I just, it's, 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 you're, it's going to be a tough sell to kind of the, you know, um, Charlie Kirk. T- uh, crowd for the audience doesn't know that it's kind of sort of this sort of alternative college Republicans, but it's a MAGA college Republicans group. It's going to be a tough sell taking these kids from, from Donald Trump back to, you know, George HW Bush, Mitt Romney style Republicanism. <laughs> I think that, they, that unfortunately a lot of the tactics and the racial grievance and the mindset of Trump is burned in in a way that's a, a blowout will help, but, but it's going to take a long-term project to stuff it out. And the, and the other factor, of course, is this uh, demographic tsunami headed their way, which has been accelerated by Donald Trump. And the Republican Party is going to have to come to grips with that at some point, that you, you, you cannot alienate women, young people, Hispanics, African-Americans, and lose the Asian-American vote overwhelmingly and expect to be a successful national party. And so all of those numbers, all of those trends are heading in the wrong direction, and Maybe they could eke out an electoral college victory, you know, drawing to an inside straight with Donald Trump in 2020, although I agree with James. I don't think he's going to do it, but you could conceivably do it. But after after this year, then that's, you know, that's the that's the deluge. The most amazing thing about this, all my life in politics, you tried to get people to vote for you. Right. I mean, you tried to, you know, say if you got 42 percent, you go, shit, let's do better. They don't care. They don't try to get people to vote for it. They don't even want, they act like they don't want converts. This is a thing across the aisle, by the way, James. I, I worry about this on the Democratic side. I, you know, I appreciate your, the kindness that you've shown us, but, I, you know, Charlie and I haven't exactly been welcomed by, as liberators um, on the left uh, either. It's like, hey, could we just like point out to people that nuance actually matters, that, you know, there's a difference between Hubert Humphrey and Che Guevara. There's a difference between a Mitt Romney and a Donald Trump. And so this this you guys are all complicit. Every conservative um, has always been a closet Trumpist. He's just articulating what you people have always believed. Well, that basically says you don't want converts. So what, what Tim is mentioning is a real thing, although I, I also – I, I think this year there is sort of a willingness to the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm willing to I'm willing to accept it on those terms. I, I I will tell you this: metropolitan triumphalism is what keeps the Democrats from winning more elections. They give off the odor that they think they're smarter and better than other people, and that's dumb. That's a dumbass strategy. If I ever saw one, and and I know it exists because I hear it a lot. I'm not saying it's certainly not who Joe Biden is, certainly not who Bill Clinton was. I don't think you think it's who Obama was. But that is a goddamn problem. This smugness and this sense that they know everything and no one else knows shit. That I'm, I'm, at least Biden is not doesn't f- foster that image, and I'm, I'm happy about that. Well, I agree. Let me let me we we're running out of time. Let me ask you one final question. I don't want to be. Let's assume Biden wins by five. I don't know, maybe seven. 330 electoral votes. Uh, you know, he carries Michigan. He carries Florida, uh, North Carolina. What will Trump do? 
I'm not worried about Trump leaving. I, I think this is a lefty conspiracy, and and Trump is just Trump just likes to whine and complain. I think he'll send a lot of mean tweets about it. Um, he'll he'll call people names, uh, and uh, that's about it. I think the one the one gift we've got from this Trump administration is that Bannon left, and that that bought with Barr being the exception, he doesn't have a lot of great operators around him to uh, to put into place. You know his worst impulses. Um, I, I I am far more. I'm far more worried about it. I, I think that he will do whatever. He certainly is poised to challenge the legitimacy of this election, to raise doubts about it, to claim fraud. Um, he will leave office. He, I don't think he'll have to be physically escorted, but he'll create this myth of that, that he didn't lose. He was stabbed in the back. And if you want a really dystopian vi- vision, you know, what stops Donald Trump defeated? from running in 2024. And if you think that's crazy, which Republican would stand up against him and run against him and could beat him in a Republican primary? Agreement with Charlie. Trump or Trump Jr. will run in 2024, for sure. It's the only time I am praying then for someone's poor health. Uh, You guys have been fabulous. I want to tell anyone out there who does uh, does not read the bulwark every day, you are really making a big mistake. Uh, Charlie Sykes uh, and Tim Miller, you have been great guests. Uh, And I look forward to the day, maybe about eight months from now, where we can have one again and we can argue about taxes or health care, because you guys are the thank you very much. Thank you. James, I don't think I've ever read a better or more important presidential biography than Ron Chernow's grant. It was a catalyst for Leonardo DiCaprio's seven-hour documentary on the History Channel uh, this week. And Chernow really set the historical record straight. And we are very fortunate to have the very same Ron Chernow, author of numerous great works on the House of Morgan, George Washington, and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a musical, Ron, on Grant, but it is one fabulous book and a, a fascinating presidency. You, you capture a brilliant general, but a president who accomplished much far more than any deficiencies, but yet most of us growing up had a sense that Grant won the Civil War, Lee was a better general, Grant was a drunk and a failed president. All untrue. How did that false perception take hold for so long? Well, in terms of the false perception of Grant as a general, that he was a brutal butcher and a hopeless drunk, that really came out of a school of Southern historians called the Lost Cause School, that um, after the uh, Civil War, with the South uh, defeated, the South really tried to create a narrative uh, that would make them feel better about what had happened. And as part of that, Robert E. Lee was glorified not only as the superior general, but as a perfect Christian uh, gentleman. Um, Grant was vilified as a brutal uh, butcher, but, you know, it doesn't really stand up to uh, analysis because during the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant captured three entire Confederate armies. 1862 captured 13,000 Confederates at Fort Donaldson. 1863 captures 31,000 Confederate Army at Vicksburg. And then most famously captures 28,000 Confederate soldiers at Appomattox Courthouse and Robert E. Lee in 1865. Robert E. Lee never captured a single Union Army. So why has Lee been puffed up as the great general and Grant um, deflated as the failure. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, you know, James and I both are, are Civil War buffs, but I'm going to defer to him in a moment on Grant as a general and Grant in war. But talk a little bit about his achievements as president of the United States for eight years. Yeah, because, again, one of the myths that I was trying to combat with uh, Grant was that uh, it was a failed presidency uh, marred by scandal. In fact, you know, the first time that they did a uh, poll of presidential historians in 1948, Grant came in next to last. Only Warren Harding was considered worse. Three years ago, Grant had risen to number 28. This year, he's risen to number uh, 21. So he's now in the top uh, half. What I argue in my book was that the scandals were very real, and I spend a lot of attention on it. But that I think that that was the minor story 
of his administration in the larger scheme of things. I think the major uh, story of Grant's administration is what he did to protect those four million uh, slaves who had not only been freed, but had become full-fledged American citizens in the case of black males with the right to vote. It had generated a very, very uh, violent uh, backlash in the white South in the form of the Ku Klux Klan. And it was really Ulysses S. Grant, very courageous and determined campaign, crushed the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan that, alas, is still with us. It stems from the revival of the Klan in the 1920s and uh, 1930s. But I thought that the whole story of Grant as the most important protector of the African-American community between the time of Abraham Lincoln and Lyndon Baines Johnson, I felt that that was a completely forgotten chapter of American history. It was like there was amnesia about it. Yeah, and it's a very important one. Also, when he left office, you captured, he was a global uh, superstar. Uh, and then he went on while dying to write one of the really, really uh, uh, great memoirs hailed by Mark Twain. Yeah, his around the world uh, trip after he's president is very, very uh, interesting because he travels for uh, two and a half years. He's greeted by everyone from Queen Victoria to Prince Bismarck to Tsar Alexander II. He actually pioneers the role of post presidential diplomacy. He arbitrates a dispute, uh, an offshore dispute between uh, China and uh, Japan. And he was recognized as the greatest American of the second half of the 19th century after Abraham Lincoln. In fact, when you look at Grand's tomb on the Upper West Side of uh, Manhattan. It's the largest mausoleum in North America. And why? Because Grant was considered that major uh, figure. And then for reasons we were just talking about, his reputation went into decline. And luckily in recent years, not only in my biography, but in a whole uh, slew of books over the last uh, 20 years, I think that he's being restored to his rightful place, not as a perfect president, but as really a very good and very important one. So Fort Donaldson on to, to Appomattox, Grant is probably the most successful general officer in the history of the United States Army. Mm -hmm. we, were there any tells earlier in his life that would, you would look back and say, gee, I should have caught this? And, you know, he was really, we knew he had real leadership capacity. And Question, uh, James. You know, he went to West Point. He was kind of lackluster. He graduated in the middle of his uh, uh, class, uh, but he did show leadership qualities there. People said that he was very famous for his sense of fairness and justice with the other students. But I think that the real tip-off is he serves in the Mexican uh, War for uh, four years. He was a quartermaster, and it was really where he learned the logistics of supporting a modern army, which would be very important during the Civil War. But I think the real tip-off is that as a quartermaster, master during the Mexican War, he was not obligated to fight in any battle. He could have just hung back in the rear, but he made a point of fighting in every single battle. This is real courage. This is real patriotism. You know, we're exposed to a lot of fake patriotism at the moment, but Grant showed us, starting in the Mexican War, that soldier sense of duty, a patriot sense of honor, and I fear that these are qualities that are being lost in our present political com culture of nonstop self-promotion. So I think I think the tip off and people did see it was in the Mexican war that this quiet uh, quartermaster again and again was willing to risk his life for his country without any self aggrandizement. So I, this is a little known fact. I'm from Louisiana. My great grandfather was actually a soldier in the Union Army. And I, was, I had a much better than you would think undergraduate history education at LSU. But that was your history department in the 60s with T. Harry Williams and a bunch of other people sure. who were first ranked Civil War historians. And they mm -hmm. were decidedly not lost cause people. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we were not educated through that prism. Right. And he was always a huge Grant guy. You know, I wrote the book Lincoln and His Generals. Mm -hmm. And he sort of set the whole tone until you come along, you know, people, oh, you can't say Grant was better than Lee. Oh, God, how can you say that, James? You can't, but look at all the people he killed. Look at how big his army was. And, of course, that's mm -hmm. all been conveniently deconstructed here. But I want to ask you specifically about the Overland campaign. Sure. Because that where the butcher, the whole butcher thing, that was the impetus for, for that. Shiloh, too, but probably more out about the Overland campaign. Hasn't some recent scholarship shed some new light on the whole Overland campaign and the casualties? 
Well, um, yes. Um, recent scholarship has shown that uh, Grant's losses uh, as a percentage of his army were very comparable to um, Robert E. Lee. So it wasn't that, you know, um, Grant was being heedless and careless with his men and Robert E. Lee, you know, wasn't. There were kind of massive casualties on both sides. And uh, Grant uh, felt, uh, and he was fully um, supported in this by Lincoln, that nothing but, you know, relentless and persistent uh, attacks um, would defeat the Confederate army. You know, one has to understand that Grant had a much harder uh, task to do during the Civil War. All Robert E. Lee had to do was to kind of live to fight uh, another day. He didn't need to, as I was saying before, actually capture uh, any Union armies. Um, Grant, in order to end the war, uh, had to actually capture and destroy um, all of the Confederate armies uh, in the field. And just, James, to go back to a point that you uh, mentioned in passing in terms of the northern population being uh, much larger than the south and northern manufacturing. The last year of the war, during the Overland Campaign, when Grant for the first time faces off uh, against uh, Robert E. Lee, Grant had been preceded by six Union generals who had the exact same advantages in terms of northern manpower and manufacturing that Grant had. Those six preceding generals had all been defeated by Robert E. Lee. Grant was able to defeat Lee, so that there was something uh, more uh, behind Grant's success than mere advantages of population and manufacturing strength. Yeah, and I hesitate to point out, he commanded the entire, although he was, am I correct in this, he went with Meade during the Overland campaign. I mean, Grant's strategic uh, genius was that um, at the time in 1864, when he becomes the, uh, the general in chief with five Union armies uh, under him, those five uh, Union armies had been acting independently of one another. And what this allowed the South, which had the smaller uh, army and population to do, was every time the Union attacked in one place was to uh, reinforce uh, their troops there. Grant realized that um, if he would simultaneously attack many different uh, places, the South would be unable to uh, to do that. And so he was really a, a mastermind. So people don't realize that it wasn't just what Grant was doing in Virginia uh, against Lee that was uh, you know his making, but he was responsible for Phil Sheridan cleaning out the Shenandoah Valley, which was the breadbasket for Robert E. Lee's army. He was the mastermind behind uh, Sherman's march to the sea and then up through the uh, uh, Carolinas. So all of these generals were um, acting under uh, Grant's grand strategic uh, plan. So he was much more than just a hard-hitting uh, tactician. He was, as I think most of the people at West Point would agree, you know, the greatest strategist that we have uh, had, as well as a very fine tactician. Let me ask you about his, his remarkable relationship with William Tecumseh Sherman, who you just mentioned. Right. Um, well, <laughs> the relationship was amazing. Um, Sherman said only half facetiously, he said, Grant stood by me when I was crazy, and I stood by him when he was drunk, and now we stand together um, always. There were really only two generals whom Grant had such implicit confidence in that he would uh, delegate total authority, and that was Phil Sheridan and uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. And the relationship between Sherman and Grant is particularly uh, interesting since, uh, you know, it was Ulysses, the, the silent, as someone once said, Grant could be silent in several languages, um, whereas William Tecumseh Sherman was kind of a mile a mile a minute uh, talker. Grant, um, one reason that Grant succeeds both during the war and uh, after in a way that even uh, Sherman doesn't is Grant um, is someone who embraces fully both of the aims of the war, both preservation of the Union and um, emancipation of the slaves. Uh, Sherman was much more conservative after the war. Sherman was very, very critical of what Grant was doing in terms of sending federal troops into the to the South. And Sherman said, you know, white Southern gentlemen will take care of any of these KKK outrages. Well, guess what? A lot of those white Southern gentlemen, you know, were, uh, if not behind the, uh, the Klan, even putting on hoods at night and uh, chasing down blacks. So that there were very significant differences between uh, Sherman and Grant. But in terms of a wartime uh, partnership, it was absolutely ideal. I think succeeded in importance only by the uh, partnership between Grant and Lincoln. I just wanted you to quickly address the charges about uh, Grant's drinking. Yeah, I 
spent an enormous amount of time uh, researching this, and what I came up with was uh, this: was that Grant was indeed um, an alcoholic. I say that because, by his own admission, he could never take just one drink. One drink became two, three, and four. Um, as soon as he started drinking, there was a very marked. Uh, personality change, and Grant himself recognized that he was an alcoholic. He already had joined the Temperance Lodge when he was in his 20s, and most remarkably, when he became Brigadier General early in the war, um, he had his adjutant, uh, John Reynolds, um, made Grant swear that he would not touch a drop of liquor for the rest of the war, or he, Rollins, would quit his uh, staff. Well, that was quite remarkable that uh, Grant was willing to have well, I guess they would call an AA his sponsor on his staff and ready to call him out if he if, if he drank. There were moments where um, during the war when he drank, but never on the eve of a battle, never during a battle. But he had a way after a battle when the pressure was off of slipping off to another city where his men would not see him and having a two or three day bender. But then, according to Sherman, he had a way of coming back fresh as a rose. Well, I, I hope I'm not. James Carville, if you have one more question, uh, jump in and then we'll thank Ron. He has been just, he, he's exceeded our lofty expectations. So I think it was Sherman that said a grant. He, he did something to effect. He don't give a damn what the enemy does. And, you know, he had all of this. So he, he goes, he's after Chattanooga, I guess. Lincoln brings him up. And yeah. at that time, Lee was a god. I mean, yeah, I did Gettysburg, but he, you know, and Grant just kept blanking him, just didn't give a shit. Grant also realized when he came um, uh, east and was traveling with uh, the Army of the Potomac, he realized that the first thing he had to do was to shatter the mystique of Robert E. Lee being this godlike figure with these sort of magical uh, powers. Lee had so bamboozled, you know, one Union army after another in uh, Virginia. And there's a, there's a famous moment that during the bloody uh, wilderness battle in May 1864 uh, when uh, a Union officer comes to Grant all panicky and in the lather saying, Lee is going to do this to us and Lee is going to do that. And Grant says to him, you all seem to think that Lee is going to do a somersault and land on our rear and both of our flanks at the same time. He said, I want you to go back to your tent and start thinking about not what Lee is going to do to us, but what we're going to do to Lee. And I think that that was really kind of a, a turning point in the war that uh, Grant uh, realized that Robert E. Lee had gotten into the heads of the Union soldiers who had endowed him with all of these um, uh, mysterious properties. Well, uh, he is one of the greatest generals in the history uh, of the American military. He was a very good president, as you pointed out, an historic figure. And Ron Chernow, uh, such a contribution you made with that book. Uh, I'm sure you've been watching the uh, you watched the History Channel series because you were a, a star in it. You think it was pretty good? Yeah, I think it's excellent, and I very much like the performance of the actor who plays uh, Grant. His name is Justin uh, Salinger, and I think that he captures Grant's toughness, uh, Grant's uh, sensitivity, and also Grant's uh, sadness is kind of a shadow uh, over his face, but he really kind of gives the viewer a sense of what a sensitive and thoughtful man Grant was under the surface. And Grant, you know, we hear so much about empathy during the pandemic. It's amazing how many times during the Civil War Grant really showed empathy, and not just to Union wounded, but even to um, Confederate uh, prisoners who had been uh, wounded. He always insisted that if there was a Confederate and a Union uh, soldier lying wounded side by side, he always insisted that the stretcher bearers take both of them uh, uh, off the field of battle, not just the Union soldier. Well, I wish we had him in the 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue now, Ron, because he would show that empathy and he also would show toughness, uh, which has been lacking uh, in the last couple of months. We need a U.S. grant right now. Yeah, and he said, you know, he, he led by uh, example. He also, one last point out, you know, sense of shared sacrifice. 750,000 people uh, died uh, during the, uh, the civil, uh, civil War. The way that Grant motivated uh, his men was he led by example. One thing they didn't show in the History Channel uh, series was that Grant very often 
would wear um, the, the blouse and pants and boots of a private. People said the only way that you knew that he was you know, the uh, general in chief was from the stars on his shoulder straps. Otherwise, he dressed like his men, he ate like his men, and it was the reason that um, they so respected him. He wasn't like a George McClellan or a Winfield Scott kind of puffed up with you know medals and um, military uh, finery. He was really one of the men. Well, he was a he was a great one. And Ron Chernow, I really mean that. You made such a contribution with that book. I loved it. Uh, I read it twice. Uh, I may go a third time now. And you were a great guest. And be safe. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I'll tell you one story. William just tells about the little girl from Sunday school in Richmond in the 30s. Came home after Sunday school and says, Mom, I forgot. Was General Lee in the Old Testament or the New Testament? <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful story. <laughs> well, listen, guys, it was so nice being with you uh, today. I hope a lot of people get to uh, uh, hear our uh, conversation. And uh, thank you for uh, honoring uh, the, the general in the book. Great talking to you both. Bye. All right, James, stay safe. And thank all of you for listening to 2020 Politics War Room. Follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Politics War Room. And thank you for subscribing to the show. And uh, if you leave us a five-star review, we really wouldn't mind that. Uh, We will be most grateful. And for James Carville, I'm Al Hunt. We'll talk to you next week. And please continue to stay safe out there.